Blessed is our God always, both now and ever, and to the ages of ages. Amen. Good evening, my uh, beloved children. I see we have a full house here tonight, standing room only. Looks like a lot of you must be interested in marriage, and that's good. Now, I'm sure if the topic was about monasticism, half of your parents would probably be here with shotguns, and I would probably end up being lynched. Anyway, during the last session, we began to talk about the service of betrothal. We covered some of the petitions of the deacon asking God to bless the betrothed with good children, perfect love, peaceful coexistence, and God's protection. Today, we will look into another petition that prays for harmony and perfect trust that he may bless them in harmony and perfect trust. Let us pray to the Lord. We have two petitions here, oneness or harmony and steadfastness of faith. And the same petition is repeated twice. Now, one of the greatest problems in today's marriages is the lack of oneness and harmony. It is very rare today to meet or find a couple with perfect harmony. What prevails in today's homes is all kinds of emotional and psychological warfare, arguments, frictions, misunderstandings, battles, confrontations, and so on. These things do not sprout because people enjoy this type of thing uh, in their home or marriages but because we fail to learn the art of living harmoniously with our neighbor. Marriage is a great art, my beloved children, and I believe that if someone wants to live happily, he needs to learn to develop this technique, or the techniques rather, that will cultivate harmonious living with the other person. One of the keys is not to demand from the other person to conform to our wishes, but we must make the necessary adjustments to accommodate our neighbor or our spouse. Paradoxically, marriage and monasticism are very much alike. I believe that a good monk would also make a very good family man, and a good family man has all the potential to become a very good monk. We mentioned many times before that the purpose of marriage is not different than the purpose of monasticism. The purpose is to heal our fallen nature and unite with Christ. There's a very important adage from the Yerondikon, the verses or the adages of the elders that says, if you wish to live at a synobitic monastery, at a monastic community with many monks, check your own will at the door. Before you enter the gate, abandon all your opinions, your knowledge, your wants, and so on. By entering the monastery, you ought to vow ob obedience you must give up your own will, deny your likes and dislikes, your past convictions and opinions, deny it all, and enter the monastery by emptying your heart. And by doing this, you make space in your heart to fit and accept and accommodate the other person, your brother or sister. This is a necessary presupposition for the perichoresis for the acceptance and harmonious existence with the other person. By emptying yourself, you will be able to listen to your brother. You will be open-minded to what he says, to love, obey, and apply everything he says, if he is your elder or your senior brother, without backtalk. Forgive me for bringing up monastic examples all the time, but they can be invaluable to us, especially in our days of widespread confusion. 
St. Cosmas the Aetolian taught that the light of monks are the angels and the light of the lay people are the monks and the nuns. In the life of St. Pachomios, we read about an exemplary monk by the name of Theodorus, St. Theodorus the Sanctified, one of the saints of our church. At some point, God wanted to show him the meaning of true obedience, which is one of the highest virtues of the monastic ideal. One day, this Theodorus was crossing the Nile River on a public boat and observed this amazing exchange between a very difficult master and his slave. This truly eccentric, unreasonable, and generally harsh master began to look for some sort of an argument with his poor slave, and he began to announce to him, you know, this year I thought to plant a different type of plant in every groove or furrow of our farm. In one furrow, I will plant wheat. Next to it, we will plant barley. Next to it, oats, sesame. Now, for those who know anything about farming, this is not only crazy, but very difficult. And it would triple the work of the slave. The response of the slave. What a great idea. This is exactly what we need to do. So we can have all kinds of different foods from one farm. And the master continued. By the way, I also decided to irrigate our farm at night. Now, without moonlight, it would be extremely difficult to see at night without generators and electricity. The response of the slave. What a great idea. This way, we will avoid the heat of the day. This is the way to do things. The master continued to introduce all kinds of strange and unreasonable ideas, and every time the slave congratulated the master for his wisdom and ingenuity. So we read in the life of St. Theodos that no matter what and what the, uh, the master tried and how hard he tried, he was incapable to upset, discourage, or sadden his slave. This is how God showed to St. Theodos the meaning of true obedience and the technique of harmonious coexistence. Now you may think, well, this is well, this was 17 centuries ago. This doesn't really happen today. This doesn't apply to us today. This does happen today. I met such beautiful elderly monks uh, in my years in Mount Athos, only a few years ago. They were full of virtues and total obedience. One day I was expressing to Father Ephraim of Katunakia my admiration to the hermits, those monks who live on cliffs all by themselves, in the caves and the holes of the earth. I asked him, Elder, you have been here in the desert, in the desert for at least 60 years. I can imagine how much you may have seen and how much you heard from the hermits that abound in your area. Yes, indeed, uh, I did. I, I ran into many good hermits, no doubt. But there's a certain great virtue that only blossoms in the synobium, in the synobitic monastic brotherhoods. Now, what virtue is that, Elder? And he answer this question by telling me this story. Years ago, I was sent by my elder to the monastery of Vionisiu to get some table wine and some wine for Holy Communion. I took two empty flasks, about two gallons each, one to be filled with sweet black wine for the Divine Liturgy and the other uh, flask to be filled with white dry table wine. Now, this monastery, which is built on a huge rock, just like the Meteora, it's known for its wine production. Uh, the wine cellars are seven stories below, below the visitors' quarters. The wine is stored in huge barrels, barrels so huge, uh, such huge dimensions that one could possibly swim in them. The wine keeper was an elderly monk, and to get to the wine, he needed to walk down seven stories 
with very steep and dark stairs. So Father Ephraim went to this monastery early in the morning and he placed his order and waited. After a while, the monk came up and said, Father Ephraim, we don't exactly have what you ordered. We have dry black wine and white sweet wine. Hmm. Okay, that's fine. Give me what you have. After he went down and came up, Father Ephraim changed his mind. Maybe I should only take the table wine because our elder doesn't really use dry wine for the divine liturgy. So please go down, empty the white wine so I can only take back the one flask of the table wine. Very well. The elderly monk descended another seven flights of stairs, emptied the one flask, and brought it back. Father of Fram starts again. You know, what if my Yeranda doesn't like the black dry table wine? I will have to carry it all the way to our monastery up the mountain, and then, if he doesn't like it, I have to bring it back. Why don't you go down again, empty the other one too? He goes down all the way again, empties the second container of wine, and when the winekeeper returns, Father Ephraim is thinking out loud again. Hmm. Now how can I go back to my elder empty-handed? I think I'm going to take the wine back, and if he doesn't like it, we can always return it. Very well, Father, no problem. He goes down again and returns with the two filled containers. About 40 minutes before the departure of the boat, Father Ephraim says, I got it. Why don't you empty them again? We will leave the containers behind and we will send you a message to tell you exactly what we want. Great, no problem, Father. He went down and up the stairs seven, eight times for half a day. After he returned, Father Ephraim asked him, Now tell me the truth, Father. After all these trips, you must be quite upset with me. You must be a little angry with me, thinking that I deserve to wear some of this wine, right? Oh no, not at all, Father Ephraim. Not a single thought like that. But why? Father Ephraim asked. This is a cenobitic monastery. We are cenobitic monks. We learn to do total obedience and to serve our brothers without a second thought. The cenobitic monk does not simply learn to tolerate the other person. He does not think that my friend here is a little crazy. What can I do? Not like that. They don't think like some pious women, some church women, who tell their husbands over and over again, what can I do? You are my cross. This is not very nice to keep telling your husband that he is your cross. Your husband is strict and difficult, and you keep looking at him like a tyrant. And if you stay patient, you will go to paradise as a martyr. This is not the right way. You must have absolute love for the other person, and you must not think that good thing he's married to me because no one else would be able to put up with him. No, you must have nobility and rise above the weaknesses of your brother and you will do whatever it takes to accommodate him. When you commit yourself to live with another person as husband and wife, if you want harmony and oneness, you will benefit much by following the example of the monks. You must check your selfishness at the door. You can't say, look, mister, I am a microbiologist and I don't do dishes. Or at least let me show you the scientific way of doing dishes. Or I am a doctor and I don't do vacuuming. No house can stand under these conditions. You know, my beloved children, uh, of course, I, I never got married. I'm a monk, but I remember such wonderful scenes from my monastic experience that I often think if the people in the world knew and apply these principles, how beautiful their marriages would become. 
I remember this wonderful elderly monk at St. Paul's Monastery. He was tall, snow white, with a beard down his belly, and full of joy, Father Methodius. We were very young at the time. I think we were about your age, about 20 years old. And uh, we used to go to the all-night vigils there. And Father Methodius was running around trying to serve everyone, well, along with other monks as well. And he would bring us food and bring us drinks. And he was full of joy. And we would always ask him for things like, can you bring us a little more bread, a little more wine? And he would respond, with much joy, with great joy. Or can we stay a couple more days? Oh, it'll be our honor, please, by all means. Or can we come back next weekend and bring 15 other people with us? Oh, it will be our great honor. It will be our joy to have you. And he meant it. He always said, as you like, as you please. We never heard him correct or dictate or do things this way. This is how we do things at this monastery. Never. We were so happy to be near him because he was full of true joy and peace because he was serving his brothers. The most difficult thing for him was to do his own will. He reached the depth of humility and totally forgot how to become upset or argue about anything. And speaking of arguments, I think I may have told you uh, the story about the two arguing monks in a desert. Well, I think I did, but we do have a lot of new students, so it would be good to repeat this story again. This is a great and a beautiful story which shows what happens when man becomes developed spiritually. These are simple things that we ought to learn from our home. We should not need the gospel or the saints to tell us how to live with people. God has instilled these things in our nature. We are social beings. Do we need Christ and his gospel to tell us how to live with another person? So we read in the Yerondikon, in our lives of the desert saints, the following story. Two ascetics lived together many, many years, 60, 70 years. And towards the end of their lives, uh, they, the one that was a little bit more comical than the other, said, You know, Father, we've been living together an entire life, and we never had an argument. I heard that people in the world argue all the time. Now, we should try to have at least one argument before we die. The other one, who was a little bit more simple, said, As you wish, Father. If you want, we can have an argument. Let's try to have one. But how do we do it? Do you, have, do you know how? The first one goes, I think I have an idea. We will take this water pot, we'll put it in the middle, and we'll say that this belongs to me. And then you will say, no, this belongs to me. And then I will say, no, this is mine. And then you'll say, no, it's mine. And before you know it, we'll have an argument. So the first one started, this water pot is mine. The second one goes, no, Father, I think it's mine. The first one repeats again, no, it's mine. And the second one says, oh, okay, if it's yours, just keep it. You can have it. So these two great ascetics died without being able to complete their first argument because they learn how to live with each other, to live with one another. If people do not learn some of these basics, they cannot even live on their own. I have seen people argue all by themselves. I saw someone kick his refrigerator without anyone being around him, around him anyone bothering him. Or they take the cell phone and slam it on the floor if they don't get their way or if something doesn't go right. My beloved children, the underlying cause of all these things is the great illness of egotism. They all sprout from the selfish will. Man wants to do things his way, his way or the highway. And he takes this ill attitude in his marriage 
and he center, centers everything around his highness, around his egotistical will. He wants people to bow down to his beliefs, opinions, and convictions. This is what I like. This is the right way. This is what I want uh, out of this life. And if you don't do things my way, I will never be happy. They finally get a child or two, if they get that far, with this kind of attitude. And then the saga continues. I want to raise my child this way. No, that's the wrong way. No, I don't agree with that. He's also my son. He's my child. My child, your child. I gave birth to him. And they turn their house upside down because they're both spiritual midgets. And everyone around them suffers and pays dearly for all this, for this spiritual infancy. In the absence of harmony, everything and everyone becomes suspect. Your mother is influencing you. Why is she coming around anyway? She has no business here, forgetting that she's not just her mother or his mother. You're looking at your mother-in-law as something foreign to you? Because you never really grasp the mystery that turned you into one flesh with your husband or your wife. You never understood or comprehended the power of this great mystery. If you became one flesh with your husband or wife, then how can you say your mother or his mother or her father? You are both one flesh, so her mother is also your mother. Most of this is forgotten after a year or two, and when everyone demands his individual rights and wants, his selfish desires to be met, then the marriage becomes dysfunctional, like most marriages today. Now you may think, so I got married to lose my self, to lose my identity? I got married so I can be turned into an animal? Not exactly. And speaking of animals, I, I just remember a, a funny story from a small girl who came to her first confession. She was about four or five years old, and she came for her first confession, and she says, I kick my mama. What? You kick your mom only? No, I also kick my dad. Uh, do you kick anyone else? Oh, yes, I also kick my brother. Well, congratulations. You're kicking your entire family around. So he asked, are people supposed to kick one another? The little girl was perplexed for a moment, and she said, well, I think not. I said, doesn't kicking belong to some animals that you know? Can you tell me of an animal that kicks others like you do? She said, yes, the donkey. And after she said this, she immediately turned red from shame, realizing that she was acting like a donkey. She said, okay, I will never do this again. All right, very well. So a few months later, she comes back and she says, oh, I don't kick my parents anymore. I, I now spit on them. Now, I, I was looking for an animal that spits, but we couldn't find uh, an animal that does that except men. So we stayed at that. As you can see, my beloved children, a lot of this has to do with our upbringing and how we are taught to communicate with the other person. Man does not lose his identity in the marriage. He needs to lose his stubbornness and egocentricity, the very thing that happens in true Orthodox monasticism. Initially, it may sound harsh and painful to deny yourself to deny your will, to become everything to everyone, as St. Paul says. I will be everything to everyone, just to save a few. This sounds scary at first, scary and humiliating, a self-annihilation at best. But there is a paradoxical mystery at hand here. We must descend to Hades, put to death our egocentric, desires, and only then we will begin to resurrect as a new being. Once we shed these selfish ambitions, then we will begin to discover our hidden men, our true self. 
you suddenly discover the health of your soul and your most genuine self, your most genuine expression and your true humanity. Man expresses himself correctly when he acquires the sacrificial spirit because sacrifice is the ultimate expression of love. Man is a loving creation in the image of his loving God, his loving creator. God is love, and as an image of God, man must also be imbued with love. One of the attribu attributes of true Christian love is to radiate, reach out, and be surrender to the other person, to the neighbor. This is what the most genuine of all men did for us. He emptied himself, he surrendered his will to his Father, and he became man for all of us. Christ did not come as God to announce, look here, I am your God, and I'm going to stay at that very high mountain. I'm going to stay there for a while, and if you want, you can climb this mountain to find me. No, he lowered himself, he emptied himself, he hid his divinity, he became 100% men, just like all of us, to meet us at our wretchedness. He wanted to meet us and converse with us on our level. He finally expressed the depth of his love by dying for us. Not simply dying, but suffering excruciating torture. He could have died in a more civil manner with a more dignified death. Why did he choose to be betrayed, ridiculed, spat upon, flogged, and hung on a cross? He did all these things to show his immense love for men and to move the calloused hearts of men with his sacrifice. He did not try to convert us or reach us with the splendor of his divinity or his power or his miracles. He did not try to compel us like a dynast or like the God of the false prophet Muhammad. We would have changed or else. This would be strangling our God-given freedom, our free will, which is a precious attribute of God's image in men. He dealt with us with complete freedom. He incarnated, he hid his, his divinity, he emptied himself, he died for us, and he has left us completely free to accept him or deny him. This is what's expected from someone who loves another person. You don't have the right to say to the other person, I love you, I can't live without you, and if you don't marry me, I will commit suicide, or I will kill you and kill myself so no one else can have us. This is not love. These are thoughts of people who belong to the psychiatric word, to the worst of psychopaths. If you truly love the other person, you sacrifice yourself for him or her without daring to ask or demand anything in return. From the moment, my young friends, you begin to demand things from the other person, from the person that you think you love, you must know that you are still in a state of illness. If we love and demand, this is not genuine love. This is love of self, a love that seeks its own. It is full of poison. True love is to love the other person unselfishly with a love that does not seek its own. To love unconditionally without expecting anything in return. Do not even expect to be loved back. You must not feel the need to be loved back. You must be absolutely content by giving the opportunity to exercise your love for this person next to you. This is the love that overcomes all obstacles. This is the love that overcomes the world. Unfortunately, we have filled our hearts with the precepts, concepts, and illnesses of this world and ignore the true medicine of the traditional Orthodox Gospel of Christ.